It's, uh, it's a great honor to, uh, to be here to, to celebrate Karen's birthday. Um, I, I've known Karen since uh, the late 70s, probably 1976 or 77. Uh, and um, we, uh, we worked together a lot in the, um, in the early 1980s on some, some problems of uh, common interest. So um, <clears throat> I, I would like to um, uh, give a talk beginning with uh, some work that Karen was doing um, at the time I first met her in the, in the late 70s. And so, um, and that had to do with, with the, a joint work with uh, Jonathan Sachs, the, the sachs back there. And so let me, just to put it in context, um, uh, it had to do with uh, uh, properties of Riemannian manifolds. So, so let's think of a, an n-dimensional, say, compact <coughs> uh, Riemannian manifold. <clears throat> and then um, the question is, what are the, what are the methods of, of understanding the geometry for such manifolds? And well, I claim before Karen and, uh, and um, a few other people, almost all of the methods involved um, in understanding the geometry had to do with the behavior of geodesics and the distance function. So, so, uh, so the, of course, a Riemannian manifold has uh, the curvature invariant, the Riemann curvature tensor. And so, and so most of Riemannian geometry had to do with, with um, uh, the understanding of geodesics and how the curvature tensor affects geodesics, in particular, the focusing properties, which uh, uh, the curvature is a second order uh, effect, has a second order effect on geodesics. And in fact, there was a lot of progress in Riemannian geometry made uh, from that point of view. Um, on the other hand, in more recent times, although I'm, I'm definitely part of the Ben in this in this uh, in this conference, it's um, uh, it, it's actually at the time Karen was doing this, and I was uh, I was uh, finishing my PhD. It was a relatively new uh, uh, um, a new uh, subject, and and that is um, uh, the understanding of of say higher dimensional objects in Riemannian manifolds. So so. Um, so you can also, instead of looking at geodesics, you could look at surfaces in a manifold. And, and you know, geodesics have the property that they uh, at least locally minimize the arc length. And so you could look at surfaces that minimize the area, or you could look at maps from some between manifolds. And then you could try to construct um, uh, sort of geometrically natural um, uh, surfaces or maps and try to understand what they say about the, uh, the geometry of the manifold. And so, and so the, the Sachs-Uhlenbeck theorem is in that spirit. And so it's, it's, it's the problem of studying the, uh, the energy. And so the, 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 uh, the domain manifold is S2, the Sachs-Uhlenbeck theorem. You consider maps from S2 into uh, M. Uh, and then uh, the functional that, uh, that was studied is related to the area, in fact, so it's actually the energy functional. So it's the integral over S2 of the, the norm of the differential squared integrated with respect to say the standard metric on S2. Um, and um, so it's a very simple looking functional. It's a kind of Dirichlet integral. Uh, and then uh, you can ask, well, does this functional have critical points? And so, so it's not hard to see that if that a critical point, so if U is critical, uh, for the energy, then, then in fact, it's a harmonic map. It's what's called harmonic. It satisfies a nonlinear version of the Laplace equation. Uh, and also because of the, the fact that the domain is S2, there's a certain global property that arises, namely it's automatically conformal. It's harmonic and also it's conformal. That means it preserves angles. And these two properties together make the image of U a minimal surface. So if I take sigma, which is <clears throat> U of S2, this is actually a minimal that means zero mean curvature, h equals zero, which means um, it is uh, locally a critical point for the area functional. Okay? And so the energy and the area have this very special interaction in the, in, uh, in the two-dimensional case. And so in particular, 
uh, understanding the critical point theory for this problem uh, is, uh, it, it, it produces, if you can find critical points, it produces, it produces minimal two spheres in, in the manifold. And so, by the way, if you, if you replace S2 by S1 or an interval, then this would just be the geodesic problem. So the critical points would be, would be geodesics with constant speed uh, parameterization, especially parameterized geodesics. So I'm a little rusty giving talks. I, 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 <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't really given, given talks for a couple of years, <laughs> a few exceptions. I have taught of that, so <laughs> I guess I can pretend you're a calculus class. <laughs> um, but um, right, and so, so in particular, the, uh, the, the critical points are, are minimal two spheres. And so um, if you look at this problem from a, uh, a um, sort of analytical point of view, there's, there's one thing that jumps out right away. Namely, um, this uh, energy functional has a very large group of invariants. Namely, um, if I took a conformal map f from S2 to S2, it's conformal, and so we know that conformal diffeomorphism. So we know that there's a, a non-compact group of conformal automorphism of the two sphere, then um, the, uh, the energy functional is actually uh, invariant under conformal reparameterization. So this is, and so um, if you're an analyst, this sort of <coughs> is a warning sign because this is a non-compact group of transformations. So that means if you had a critical point, you could actually construct a non-compact family of them by composing with conformal transformations. And in particular, there are, there are not going to be any uniform estimates of critical points. So that's a, a crucial thing. And in fact, um, uh, what Sachs and Uhlenbeck understood um, is that when you try to construct critical points, you typically are not able to do it with a connected surface. So, so what the new phenomenon that occurs here is that is that even if you minimize the energy, you would in general not produce a single S2, but it could break into pieces. So there's this bubbling phenomenon that, that arises in this problem, which is a, a very key aspect of the problem. Um, and, and actually it occurs in many, many other uh, conformally invariant uh, uh, variational problems. Uh, So in other words, if you take a given map and you try to minimize the energy in the homotopy class, say, typically you won't be able to do that. You will, you may instead produce something like two separated spheres, which are joined by, you know, some curve, which you don't see from uh, in the limit from the energy point of view. So you get this bubbling phenomenon. So anyway, Sachs and Uhlenbeck uh, uh, were able to, uh, to uh, solve this problem, let me just state the theorem. So they proved a very, very general uh, theorem. So the theorem is that uh, if the manifold is a compact Riemannian manifold, uh, if some homotopy group is non-zero, if I k <coughs> them uh, zero for some k greater than or equal to two, then there always exists a critical point. There exists a non-constant u. Uh, so that's two uh, into m, which is a critical point for the problem. So in other words, so this, this condition that pi k be non-zero is necessary because if you, of course, if you took a manifold, say, of non-positive curvature, then, then, then only, only pi one is non-zero. It's, it's called a k pi one manifold. And then of course, such maps cannot exist because you could lift them to the universal cover and, uh, and the, there's a convex distance function. So, 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 uh, so, so it gives um, very general topological conditions under which uh, there exists a map. And moreover, after the sachs uhlenbeck work, there were more sort of quantitative um, bounds derived on, on um, things like embeddedness properties in three dimensions, uh, the Morse index of the problem, if, if pi k is non-zero. And, and these were done in order to give various applications of this theorem. And I'm going to mention, so I won't talk about the proof, of course, but I want to mention three very dramatic applications of this theorem. Um, so there was one, um, this was done in the late 70s, I think maybe the paper 
here in 1980 or so. Um, but uh, there was one that was quite early, namely um, the uh, the um, the Su Yao proof of the Frankel conjecture. So um, they proved that if you take a, a, a manifold 2n, which is Kähler, and uh, has a positive curvature in a certain sense, positive bisectional curvature, then they showed that uh, this implies that if I have a, a map u from S2 uh, into m, uh, which is uh, locally minimizing or stable, With the energy, then U is holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. And then they use that, so it gives the existence of what's called a rational curve. And they use that to show that such a manifold is biholomorphic to CPN. So that was an early application. And, and so in order to do that, they needed the existence of uh, minimizers, in this case, uh, assuming pi two is non-zero. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so that's one application that was done around around 1980, I think. Um, then there was another very dramatic variational application done by uh, McAuliffe and Moore. And that was in the late 80s, like 1988. <clears throat> they, um, they used the, um, they used the, uh, sachs uhlenbeck theory to understand the problem in Riemannian geometry it turned out to be extremely interesting. So, so they uh, did a careful study of uh, the second variation of, uh, uh, of energy and they, uh, they formulated a curvature condition, um, which is called, uh, I'm gonna call it PIC. So it's, it's called positive isotropic curvature. Uh, and they and they showed so so pick turned out to be a very interesting curvature condition. It's a it's a condition, for example, which is implied by pointwise quarter pinching. So so in Riemannian geometry, there's the sphere theorem, which says that if a manifold is positive curvature and the sectional curvatures are pinched, um, the maximum to the minimum is uh, uh, is uh, less than four. Uh, at a point, then such a manifold, if it's simply connected, should be uh, should be a sphere. And so this gave an extremely strong version of the um, the, the the theorem. So what McAuliffe and Moore did is they analyzed the second variation, and they showed that in fact, uh, in under this pick condition, uh, if uh, if you have a non-trivial map to M, then the index is in fact pretty big. The index is the Morse that is the Morse index. So. So in other words, such a, um, such a uh, map uh, cannot minimize energy. In fact, the Morse index measures the number of directions in which it's unstable, right? So it's the index of instability. So the Morse index is at least, it's on the order of N over two. Uh, and so um, in particular, using the Sachs and Uhlenbeck theorem and together with uh, some refinements involving um, uh, um, uh, estimating the Morse index, they were able to show that a manifold like this has vanishing homotopy groups uh, up to roughly the middle dimension. And, and using that, they were able to prove, for example, the first, uh, the first uh, pointwise quarter pinching theorem. So the original quarter pinching theorem required global pinching. So it's a much, much stronger uh, condition and it used geodesic methods. So I, I don't believe there is any geodesic method to prove a pointwise quarter pinching theorem. It's a, it, it seems to be completely beyond the methods there, but, but McAuliffe and Moore were able to use this sort of higher dimensional theory, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the theory of minimal, minimal two spheres or or um, harmonic two spheres, if you like, to prove that. So, so that's another very dramatic application. I'm actually leaving out some other ones, but uh, let me mention a third one, which is in a slightly different spirit. So, so you may or may not know that um, the um, min-max theory for minimal two spheres also is used in the Poincaré conjecture. So this is, this is called Minimal Cosy. Mm. 
Um, so um, they showed that in a, in a three manifold, which is a potential counterexample to the Poincaré conjecture, so, so pi one and then three is trivial, um, they, uh, they uh, showed that uh, you, you could um, uh, construct a min-max two-sphere, an immersed two-sphere. So there exists. So again, this also would follow from Sachs and Lindbeck. They, they gave a slightly different formulation of it. So there exists uh, uh, what's called a, um, a, uh, uh, a standard min-max. <laughs> so this roughly comes, so, so if you think of them as looking something like this, the three sphere, it comes from a sweep out where you, you sort of think of uh, a family of two spheres which start at a point and end at a point. Now, if you have a, a, a fake S3, of course, you won't be able to find embedded two spheres like that, but you'll be able to find immersed ones. And so, and so using, uh, using um, the, uh, the variational theory, they used it for any given, for any metric on, uh, on, on this um, counterexample possible to, counterexample to the Poincaré conjecture, uh, they produced a, uh, a, uh, an, a, um, a uh, min-max uh, two-sphere. And then uh, the proof, of course, uses the Ricci flow. So they, they then showed that the, the area of this two-sphere evolves in such a way that it decreases rapidly under the, under the Ricci flow. And they used it to prove finite time extinction. So that's an important step in the uh, proof of the Poincaré conjecture. Because in particular, it implies that there are only a finite number of surgeries that you have to do to, to, um, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to show that the manifold is actually a standard S3. So it's another, another beautiful application of, uh, uh, of, um, of the, uh, the min-max theory for S2s. And so um, I, I want to talk uh, now about some, some new results or some new ideas connected with this. And, um, in particular, I want to go back. So this is a somewhat separate um, uh, topic, but both of these two um, properties use, both of the first two examples I gave, use um, uh, properties of the second variation of energy. And so I want to focus a bit on the second variation. Actually, can is this board visible from? So um, let me just write it here. Second variation. <clears throat> so I'm going to think particularly of um, a two dimensional surface in some manifold uh, M. Uh, and then um, what we have to think of is uh, we want to think of the surface, which uh, uh, is, say, of least energy or at least is stable. And so what we can do is we can look at normal deformation. So we take uh, S, which will, will be a section of the normal bundle in sigma. So at each point, it's a normal vector field. And then we can think of deforming um, the surface in that direction. Now, um, the thing that's important for surfaces and what's used in these um, first two examples I gave is that if, if the surface is oriented, and of course it has a Riemannian metric, which is induced from M, then, then it's actually a Riemann surface. So it has, a, it has a complex structure. And so what's natural to do in the two-dimensional case is to think of sigma as a Riemann surface and to complexify the variations. So what we can do is we can consider this complexifying. So we answer this with C. So that just corresponds to two real variations. And then we can, we can write down the sum of the second variations in those two directions. And then after some manipulation, there's an integration by parts um, <clears throat> that comes into it. Uh, one gets, so that one gets that um, uh, sigma, the surface is stable. It's, a, it's an eigenvalue condition. If and only if for all complex variations, it's true that the integral, so I'm gonna, not gonna write this explicitly, but there's a curvature term. And then there's <clears throat> on the left-hand side, a second fundamental form term. So it's the, the Z derivative. So thinking differentiating along the surface, S is a complex normal field. And then I take the tangential component squared.
Um, you can send me the bill. <laughs> okay, it's, it's bound. And so the, the stability is this, this sort of uh, uh, eigenvalue condition. So the integral. So on the right hand side is the norm of uh, the z bar derivative of s, and then I take the normal component squared. And so this is true for any variation, or if sigma were non-compact, s would have compact support. Okay, and so and so this curvature term that arises here generally is. Uh, is the condition the positivity is the condition which uh, which uh, I call pick there, but it, but I'm not going to worry too much about that in this discussion. This term here is actually a second part of the second fundamental form surface because I'm differentiating a normal vector field and looking at its tangential component, but I'm only differentiating in the z direction, not in the z bar direction. Okay, so it's not the full second fundamental form. This term here is just. S is a normal section. I'm differentiating, and I take the normal component. This is just a uh, a d bar operator. So in fact, um, I can always I can always make the normal complexified normal bundle into a holomorphic vector bundle by by uh, uh, I can find a local basis of holomorphic sections, and and it then becomes a holomorphic vector bundle. And so, in particular, um, I can get information about uh, about stability or instability if I could solve the D-bar equation. So, so the, the question is, does uh, the normal bundle, the complexified normal bundle, and C sigma uh, with its natural complex structure, uh, have sections, have holomorphic sections? Okay, whenever you have a holomorphic section, you get a condition. If we assume the curvature term has the right sign or it's zero, then you end up showing that's part of the second fundamental form vanishes, right? And so, and so we it comes down to the question of, of uh, the behavior of holomorphic vector bundles over Riemann surfaces. And, and the reason and what's used in both of these theorems and what, what's important about the surface being S2 is uh, uh, an old theorem of, uh, of Grotendieck, which is that, uh, that if sigma is S2, the Riemann sphere, then uh, this bundle uh, E or something, then E is a direct sum of line bundles. And so, and so in particular, it's possible then to to always so in, in fact the, the because because the normal bundle is the complexification of a real bundle it's actually a degree zero bundle so in fact some of these line bundles will be non-negative so you will always have lots of sections okay and so that's sort of roughly where the n over two comes into this uh, <clears throat> this uh, McAuliffe Moore theorem that's assuming the curvature term uh, has the right <laughs> side okay and so and so from the point of view of second variation. The fact that the surface is an S two is extremely helpful to, because it gives you it gives you um, a good dimensional space of, of uh, holomorphic sections. And so, in particular, something quite remarkable which occurs here, um, and that is that the minimal S twos actually. So you can make an analogy. You, you can say, well, uh, sectional curvature is related to geodesics. So if you write the second variation for a geodesic, this becomes a sectional curvature term, and these become just uh, derivative terms along the, uh, along the geodesic. Uh, you can say that in a similar way, so like uh, pick or complex sectional curvature, the pick is related to complex sectional curvature. Uh, is related to um, minimal surfaces. Okay, and and but actually, uh, I mean that's a very rough idea. So the idea is that that while geodesics give you information about <clears throat> positive sectional, um, you get in a very similar in a in certain sense a similar way uh, information about um, 
the instability of, uh, of uh, minimal surfaces under the pick condition. So pick is a different condition. <laughs> Neither one of these implies the other. <laughs> they're, uh, they're quite different. But I want to emphasize that there's actually quite a major difference in these two. Namely, um, um, the McAuliffe-Moore theorem says that, that any stationary point is actually unstable uh, for, the, for, the, um, uh, for the energy. There's no sort of largeness condition on it. So, so this tells us it, it doesn't matter how small the surface is or anything like that. They're, they're always, you can always, because of the Grotendieck theorem, you can always produce variations that improve or that decrease the energy. Now that's not true for geodesics, right? So for a geodesic, um, you need largeness conditions. I mean, so for example, um, uh, one of the classical theorems in Riemannian geometry is that if the Ricci is bounded below by a positive constant, n minus one times kappa positive, then any geodesic of length bigger than pi over root kappa is unstable. Geodesic at the length is bigger than pi over square root of kappa, then gamma is unstable. <clears throat> of course, of course, short geodesics will be uh, generally will be stable. And similarly, if I take closed geodesics, um, let's do it right here. So I can I should avoid using this board. Um, this side. No. Okay. <laughs> let me uh, let me then go back to the first one. Okay, and so um, so similarly, um, I could take um, I could take a manifold M, which is a, a spherical space form. So I, I could take S N quotient by some finite group, which acts freely. And then of course, this has minimizing geodesics, right? So in here, I, this is non-simply connected. So so I can find minimizing geodesics. It's just that um, what happens for these geodesics is that when I go around enough times. If I go around a certain number of times, depending on the group, they become unstable. So, so in other words, a very small geodesic can perfectly well be stable even in a space of constant curvature. This, this has constant curvature one. Um, and so, and so it's just that when you when you go around uh, a certain number of times, it will lift to the sphere <laughs> and will become an unstable geodesic. Right, and so. And so in order to show that, that, that geodesics are unstable, you need to know something about already about the manifold. You need to know that geodesics are sufficiently large to do that. And in, in fact, one of the hard steps of the classical sphere theorem was the injectivity radius estimate. And that, that gave precisely that information, the fact that, that uh, closed geodesics are sufficiently large. But the, the remarkable thing is for the S2 case, no such condition is required. So, so just it's true just that every non-trivial uh, minimal S2 is in fact unstable. And so that's a very, very special feature. And so one of the things I've been interested in for a long time and about which you don't know too much really is the question of what happens if I consider a surface which is non-simply connected. So if I consider sigma two and so a couple of different ways of formulating it, but <clears throat> Um, so let's first look at a Riemannian manifold, and let's say sigma two is something like a torus, say a genus G, where um, <clears throat> a genus a sigma is at least one. So suppose I consider a closed surface of genus at least one, and I assume my manifold is picked. So it's tending to make them unstable. The question is, is it necessarily unstable? And the answer is no. And so. For example, for a torus, so I didn't say much about pick, but one of the interesting things about pick is that if I take the circle S1 and I cross it with one of these guys, say an Sn minus one mod gamma, where this is a spherical space form, and I just take the product metric, then that turns out to be strictly pick. This is for N 
greater than or equal to four is in fact strictly strictly pick. Uh, and it, it obviously has a minimizing torus in it. Namely, I can take the S1 here and I can cross it with the geodesic there, and that's a stable torus. So in particular, what must happen is that you cannot construct these, these variations that, that reduce the, the energy. And so in particular, in order to understand the, the, um, uh, the instability um, for higher genus surfaces, uh, it's necessary to assume something about, about, uh, about the largeness. And in fact, there, there's a theorem of this sort. It's partly motivated by this theorem. There's a theorem by, um, um, by, uh, by Fraser that says that, um, that says that a pick manifold cannot contain a Z plus Z in the fundamental group. Anytime it's pick, or let's, well, let's say, let me first say an easier theorem. If M is pick and uh, I look at a, a torus, sigma, which is of genus one, a minimal torus in M, then some covering of some finite covering of sigma is unstable. <laughs> okay, and, and so um, the idea of the proof is, is to look at coverings, in particular, look at look at k by k coverings. So 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 the, so the if the torus is generated by one and tau to look at k and k tau, so you expand in both directions, if you like. Uh, and then to show that in a sufficiently high covering, um, while you don't necessarily have holomorphic sections, you have almost holomorphic ones. So the idea is that if you go up to a covering, you can, <clears throat> you can find a, uh, uh, a section whose, so that dz bar s squared is less than epsilon times the L2 norm of s, and then because this term is strictly positive, uh, you'll be able to make the argument. Okay? And, so, and so it fits with this idea that, that while this, you may, the surface itself may be stable, some covering of it should not, should not be. And in particular, she used the theorem to show that the fundamental group of a pick manifold could not contain a free abelian subgroup of rank bigger than one. Okay? So it's <laughs> Z plus Z. So you can see it, in this case, it contains a Z plus A a finite group, but it, it can't contain a, a free abelian subgroup. And so, and so the idea is to represent it by a torus, and then because you can take bigger and bigger tori, they may not actually be coverings of the same torus, but you can, you can uh, make the argument that, um, that um, <clears throat> um, the, um, uh, a sufficiently large torus is unstable, and that would contradict the, the, the minimizing property. Okay, so that's uh, that's a, um, a motivating result. Now, um, I want to uh, come now to um, a um, some results. So, so generally speaking, when you study minimal surfaces, um, minimal submanifolds, it, it it can happen. So, of course, an interesting space to look at is Euclidean space, right? But the the behavior of complete global minimal surfaces in Euclidean space has to do with the local singular structure, minimal surfaces, right? If you, took a, if you took a minimal surface, which is very highly curved near some point, you could blow it up, you could expand it. And, and if the curvature is going to infinity, you could take a limit and produce a minimal surface, a complete one in, or in fact, this idea is used also in the Ricci flow. You know, when, when you get concentrations, you, you, you can do expansions and you produce global uh, surfaces, which, and if you can prove that they have very special properties, then that's telling you something about the local picture near the, uh, near the singular point. And, and, so, and so the same thing is true for minimal surfaces. And, and so in particular, it was um, of interest and there were some results obtained long ago in uh, Euclidean space by, uh, by McAuliffe. Actually, it was his thesis, which, which I directed. And so, um, so 
So, um, <clears throat> so let's uh, let's go now to to instead of Riemannian manifolds, let's just look at Euclidean space. Let's say two dimensional surfaces in Rn, and suppose they're minimal. Right? <clears throat> Uh, H is zero. Okay, and then um, then you can ask, so suppose sigma minimizes area, at least area or it's stable. Well, of course, it would be nice to say that such a surface is a plane, but of course that isn't true um, because there are lots of area minimizing surfaces in, in Rn, which are what are called J-hole morphs. So the real question is to distinguish these two classes. Okay, and by this I mean something very special. Namely, uh, J is just a constant matrix. Uh, uh, so this would be, <clears throat> say, n equals two k lies in an even dimensional space. J is a two, is a n by n matrix, and J squared is minus the identity, and J is orthogonal. So it so it respects the the, the standard dot product. So uh, J transpose it's an orthogonal matrix. So, so in other words, it's it's just a, a a rotated image of the standard complex structure on R2N. So we can think of R2N as CN by uh, using you know J, which takes the DDX to DDY and DDY to minus DDXs, and uh, and then such a um, such a surface, which is J-holomorphic, so that means the tangent plane is invariant under J. Such a surface is an example of uh, it's J-holomorphic. It's calibrated, so it's automatically uh, so it's automatically stable, minimizing, absolutely area minimizing. Okay, and so and so you could ask. So a, a nice thing to hope for. Uh, would be to say that if you have one of these high curvature regions of a um, uh, stable minimal surface, when you blow it up, you produce something J holomorphic. So that would tell you that locally it's looking like something that's that's holomorphic, J holomorphic. Okay, and so this is this is an example of what's called a Bernstein theorem in minimal surfaces. So in, in the co-dimension one case, um, the, the existence of 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 complete area minimizing surfaces uh, is related is non-trivial ones is related to the existence of singularities. So they 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 exist in high dimensions, dimension seven or higher, but not in low dimensions. And so and so this is sort of an analog of that. So here we're looking at surfaces in Rn. Okay, and so um, so McAuliffe looked at this question, and actually there's a special case which is n equals four. Where he was able to prove quite strong theorems of this sort. So, so <laughs> using the fact that the normal bundle is two-dimensional, so there's there's a and it, it's a it has a metric, there's a natural complex structure on it. So he was able to prove some very special results, including this this in a rather general form in the four-dimensional case. However, for general n, um, the results are um, are much weaker. And um, <clears throat> and for general n, he was able to prove that if sigma um, has genus zero. So that means sigma is two sphere minus some number of points, P1 up to uh, Pj, uh, and is nice at infinity. So, so this is, this is going to compactify the surface. So the, the, the tangent planes have to converge at infinity and the normal planes so that the normal bundles extend across. So the condition for that minimal surface theory is finite total curvature. Actually, if you assume sigma is topologically finite, that's finite Euler characteristic, it's equivalent to quadratic area growth. So in other words, the, the, <clears throat> the amount of area inside a ball of radius r grows at most like a constant times r squared. Okay, and so McAuliffe was able to prove again using the same structure, the Grothendieck theorem. He was able to prove that uh, uh, sigma genus zero and finite total curvature uh, and stable, sigma stable, implies sigma is J-holomorphic. Well, it, it will lie in some Euclidean, some affine subspace of Rn. And so it lies in an even dimensional subspace 
and it's holomorphic. And the proof again uses the same uh, basic property that that the complexified normal bundle has a lot of uh, lots of sections. And using the fact that it has roughly n over two sections, uh, he's able to prove that. So so in particular, um, in the genus zero finite total curvature case, he's able to do it. So again, you can ask the question just like we did for the pick case. Is this true for higher genus? <clears throat> and the answer turns out to be no. So there's a rather elaborate counterexample, which is genus two. And it's in a quite a high dimensional space. It's a two dimensional surface in R22. So it's in 22 dimensions. Uh, and they were able to show that what they did is they took a holomorphic um, uh, curve and they showed they could perturb it to make, keep it minimal and stable, but not holomorphic. And so, so the answer is no for genus two. It's not known for genus one that I, that I know of, but um, it's then natural to ask, well, suppose uh, instead of just stability, you assume also that some largeness condition, namely um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna, I'm gonna define a condition called covering stable. So, so suppose we assume that not only is sigma stable, but uh, say it's finite coverings are also. Rick, you said yeah. they have this case, for example, who, who are they? Say it again. For this Kendra example in genus two, you said they? Uh, this one, yeah, it's it's not J holomorphic for any J. And who are, who who produced that? This, oh, sorry, thank you. It's due to uh, Claudio Arezzo, um, McAuliffe, and Carola. <clears throat> right. Okay, and so. So we can ask the following question. We can first of all make a definition. Uh, let's take a two-dimensional surface. It can, can be in any manifold. Uh, we can say it's um, uh, a minimal surface, of course. We'll call it covering stable. If um, <clears throat> whenever I take a covering, I take sigma tilde, which covers sigma, I think of this is embedded in M. Um, and it, actually, for our purposes, it's enough to make to have this be a finite cover. Uh, sigma tilde is also stable. And we'll call that covering stable. So the question is, when 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 is that true? Well, somewhat surprisingly, this is always true in codimension one. So stable implies covering stable in two cases. That I know of. When, uh, so I, we can define this for any k. Uh, <clears throat> so when k equals n minus one, well, technically you also have to assume the surface is two sided. That means that the, there's an everywhere defined unit normal. So, so uh, oriented surface in an oriented manifold or uh, a two sided surface. So, covering stable. So, this is. Two side. And so the reason for that is that the stability condition uh, in this case is a scalar inequality. So see here, S is a vector, right? And so this is an eigenvalue property. So it says that a certain operator has positive first eigenvalue. Well, when, the, when, the, when, when it's a scalar problem of this type, the lowest eigenfunction al always has multiplicity one. And that's that's a special property in the in the scalar case, which is which implies this geometric result that, that in fact in codimension one, if you take a stable surface, all coverings are also stable. The other case in which it's true is the uh, the uh, calibrated case. So it's true n minus one and also calibrated. Well, because the cal the calibrated calibration condition is a condition on the tangent plane. So if the if sigma is calibrated, then sigma tilde is also calibrated. So so it's true automatically that so if you take a holomorphic curve in some homology class, you can multiply it k times and it still minimizes still minimizes the uh, 
the uh, the area in k times the homology class, right? Okay, and so so that's another <coughs> situation in which it's true. So so in particular, you can ask, and I'm going to state and I'm going to announce a new theorem here, but unfortunately, I won't have time to say much about the proof. Um, So, um, so this is a joint work uh, with Fraser. <clears throat> Statement is that um, if sigma is genus one, one, uh, this is in uh, in Rn uh, and with finite total curvature. Um, and now covering stable, so we assume it's not only stable, but covering stable. And finite total curvature covering stable in Rn surface, uh, then sigma is J over For some constant j. So it's some orthogonal complex, constant orthogonal complex structure on, on, on our end. So, so in particular, so it's, a, it's somewhat motivated by the theorem I mentioned uh, of Fraser, but it, it requires a more, a more careful um, analysis. And so the idea is again, so the So the idea is to um, is to construct almost holomorphic sections. So 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 the so now sigma compactifies. So sigma bar is then a torus T two, and the tangent and the normal bundles extend across the point. So I I now have a a holomorphic bundle over a torus. Uh, and what we do is we use the ATIA theory, which classifies, gives a classification to these bundles. So there's a famous work by ATIA from the 50s, um, which um, says that if we take this bundle E over our torus, then E decomposes as a sum of a direct sum of indecomposable bundles. So there are some positive ones some zero ones and some negative ones. And because E is self-dual itself, it's, it's a complexification of a real bundle. The negative ones are the dual or isomorphic to the duals of the positive ones. And the zero ones, there, there may be a direct sum of indecomposable bundles. That sum is, 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 um, is self-dual. Okay, and so the idea is that the positive ones are good um, because if we take a covering, they become very positive and then they're actually spanned by sections. So, so the positive ones are very good. This, the problem is the zero ones. So, so the degree zero in decomposable bundles. And, and again, Atiyah has a classification of those. Those are, those are tensor products of line bundles with a unique, very special bundle. It's called the Atiyah bundle. Um, and what we're able to show for those is that while they may not have holomorphic sections in any covering, uh, if you take the, so if our torus is, uh, has, is generated by, the lattice is generated by uh, uh, one and tau, then we show that K times the lattice, that's the universal cover C, so this surface sigma K, um, we show that for K large enough, uh, those, have, those, those, have, those have a basis of almost holomorphic sections. And we're able to not only construct a basis of almost holomorphic sections, but also to control the metric in that basis. And using that, we're able to show that the corresponding second fundamental form term that I wrote down here. So in the flat case, this is just, this just looks like this, uh, that this term is zero for, for Sections of Z, and then and then we're able to use that to show that in fact the the um, 
the surface is holomorphic for some some choice of J. So you can use you use these bundles to define J well together with the one zero and the zero one part of the tangent bundle. You can get a, a parallel um, a parallel choice orthogonal choice of uh, of J to make it J holomorphic. And so um, we actually are working on the higher dimensional higher genus case and um, it actually looks quite promising. So, so uh, the hope is that replacing the Atiyah theory by the theory of stable bundles in higher genus, we can do a similar thing. And, and that seems extremely hopeful. So, so, uh, so the hope is that this will eventually give a complete uh, uh, characterization uh, in terms of stability of these, uh, uh, at least this class of complete uh, minimal surfaces. So, so that's uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful blend of then and now. Um, <laughs> Mostly then. <laughs> oh no, I don't know. <laughs> I, I guess we have time for a question or two. Hey. So you don't have any uh, restriction on the uh, quadratic area growth from? On say that again. Um, you don't have any restriction like quadratic area growth or nothing. Yeah, finite total uh, curvature. Oh, so, finite total yeah. curvature. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's important to compare. Yeah, okay, okay, uh, otherwise, I don't know. How okay. To do it. Okay. I mean, you know, you know, it's an it's an unsolved problem. Whether if you have a a a minimal an entire minimal graph in higher co-dimension, which say is area minimizing, whether it's J-holomorphic. So McAuliffe's theorem implies that if if the area growth is quadratic, but it, it, it's not known in general. One. Yeah, uh, well, actually, I hadn't heard of the, the third uh, application uh, in the Zen part of the talk. So that was very interesting. Oh, okay. I, I knew the first two very well. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I, at the time, the Frankel conjecture was something that uh, was seemed very startling and uh, was, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I've seen descriptions of Yann's work, Yann's work in particular. So it's, and it, it's it's not uh, it's it's not referred to that is I think there's another well, proof now around the same time Maury proved a more general yeah. version of it yeah uh, I see I, yeah I, and so I have heard it yeah. mentioned but same. using a, a totally different way yeah. of producing rational curves yeah and and the question here the question here about this last one um, uh, I have a feeling that the general morphic curves are much more used than the, uh, does, does this actually, does this identification uh, <laughs> actually have uh, uh, applications or well, applications um, because? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I mean, I, I you know, the, so if you think of these as blow-ups of, I mean, it may have, uh, of course you have to be able to understand quadratic area growth is very natural for minimal surfaces because of monotonicity, but, but, uh, but if it has a, a sort of an application it would probably be of the type that um, uh, in a high curvature region uh, of a surface, uh, the, um, the surface is becoming, is closer and closer to being holomorphic, J-holomorphic. And so that, it doesn't tell you the curvature doesn't blow up, but it tells you it does so in a rather special way. And so uh, there could be applications. I, I don't know. I don't have one in mind though. Yeah. Do you Conclusion: Is it the same that if you conduct the curve with projective spirit rather than yeah. the, then you get an holomorphic curve? I think that's curve. right. Yeah. So it's actually a a, a, a holomorphic curve in projective space yes. thought of affine in the affine sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I, the schedule says we have tea and coffee in the common room now. So um, it's thank you.